Hi, my name is Joshua Negrera from the Center for Real Estate Finance Research at NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, today we're joined by Marianne Gill Martin, and we're thrilled to have her here. Um, we'll start off with a brief introduction. Good morning. It's great to be here with you. Um, my name is Marianne Gill Martin. I'm the CEO of LNL Mag and uh, Mag Partners. I am um, a hopeless ground up developer, started in the business over 25 years ago as a public developer. Uh, worked under Mayor Koch, uh, then went over to Forest City where I ran the company uh, with Bruce Ratner for two decades, finally as CEO for the last six years of my tenure there, and uh, built some of um, my uh, most favorite development projects, mostly large-scale public-private partnerships, uh, Barclays Center, the New York Times building, New York by Geary, and Metrotech. Uh, after doing that for two decades plus with Bruce Ratner, the company moved in the direction of becoming a REIT. And I started to look at the future of ground up development in New York and realized that it's best done in the private markets. And so with the company's full support and a group of eight professionals, I moved uh, to the private realm. I made a partnership with uh, David uh, Levinson and Rob Lapidus and formed l and Mag. And my intention in forming that company was to do all the great things I did on the public side, but do them with a group of people that look like the city we build for, and to demonstrate that you can create great value and beauty um, in uh, real estate for your partners or investors and for the communities in which you build. So it's a fairly kind of sim simple proposition, but it turns out that uh, in, a, in a city where there is commoditized real estate, and then there's real estate that matters, and that is everlasting, my hope was, is to do the kinds of things I was fortunate enough to be part of at Far City, uh, but to do them in the private markets in a company that's diverse and believes in equity and inclusion. Great. Uh, so we'll go into some COVID-19 related topics in a, in a bit, but first I wanted to ask, uh, what trends were you seeing in real estate prior to the pandemic? And do you see those trends continuing or shifting as we move forward? Certainly we saw a lot of irrational exuberance. Um, there was uh, a lot of optimism and um, I think things were overheated. Certainly land prices had, had uh, reached uh, pinnacles that made it impossible to imagine much more than uh, condominiums being built in New York. And I, I find that, that trend to be disturbing and distressing just because it makes for a very homogenous development landscape. It is not, um, it's not gonna improve communities and it's not going to diversify the real estate economy in New York. And so finding transactions like 28th Street where we were building, we are building a 480 unit multifamily uh, building across from FIT. The only reason we're able to do a transaction like that in West Chelsea is because the land is owned by Edison and they had no interest in parting with, with ownership and therefore did not want to see condominiums. In any other scenario, that land would have traded um, for a value that would have required a developer to build high priced condos. Um, so we are focused on areas where we can add value because there's a lot of hair on deals or there's uh, an ownership in, in land or in a building that doesn't really want to be in the business but has holdings where they're looking to optimize or maximize value. And so it became harder and harder to find transactions like that as the city was uh, frothy and full of um, expensive real estate. On the commercial side, um, we um, believe that the buildings in the city need to be updated, that we need to build healthy buildings. This is something we'll talk about post COVID, but this idea of the average office building in New York City uh, surpassing an average age of 70 years, clearly if we want to maintain ourselves as a global 21st century city, we need to improve the office uh, stock. And so we were focused on working on a number of buildings that would have allowed us to build new high performing modern buildings that responded to what tech media and um, services businesses wanted. And I think that that trend and uh, the Hudson Square area, for example, where we're hoping to build 150,000 square foot ground up building on Barrack Street, those are places where we have a keen interest because we believe that the future of the city is in large part um, going to be determined by the quality of the workspaces and the homes that people live in. And Marianne, you talked about kind of the, the opportunity that you have to, that you see to kind of take complex deals and, and add value in them. What opportunities do you see resulting from this crisis kind of once we get through this and, and how would you recommend 
and go about preparing for those opportunities? So I'm in the good fortune. I have a good fortune of being super nimble and agile because I'm spinning off um, L&L Mag into Mag Partners, buying my partners out. I've got some pipeline and my pipeline is diverse. So for example, 28th Street is on the brink of a loan closing, which will be challenging at best, but it's fully designed. It's not a project that's in construction. So we're buying out the job now with 120 day uh, periods to hold the pricing and we can issue a notice to proceed as soon as we close the loan. So I believe that we might be able to pull 10 to 20% out of the construction costs. And then in 28 months when the building opens, we'll be beyond a vaccine and we could be sitting pretty. And the, you know, the question is the underwriting right now, how do you underwrite anything in this current moment? So I think uh, for those people that have good land and haven't over, overpaid for the land and have solid designs that are frankly lines on paper, if you think about it, you can go back uh, and look at a building like our building on 28th Street and make the tweaks and improvements that seem so sensible now to create social distancing, to use technology so that there is contactless uh, entry and exit. So I think we have a great opportunity on 28th Street to build what could be one of the first multifamily towers post COVID. And I think people are gonna spend more time at home, not less. And so I'm excited about that building being a model. So for those that have um, properties and opportunities, um, I believe in cities, we are a country of cities. I do believe that New York will come back it always has and it always will. It's just gonna look a little bit different. So I think chance favors the prepared mind. And if people can try to anticipate how these buildings want to be designed and, um, and capture uh, those trends and be on the forefront of those, then I think um, there'll be lots of successes in that area. Secondly, um, working on a large uh, rezoning in Queens on the Long Island City waterfront, it's, it's in the area where Amazon was supposed to go. Um, and we could spend a whole um, episode talking about the unfortunate realities around uh, the post uh, Amazon debacle. But I can tell you that there's 28 acres on the Long Island City waterfront of which I am partners on um, a parcel there. We're working with three other developers to do a district wide rezoning. We have clean energy. We've got uh, tons of open space. We've got uh, buildings which can really address large floor plates, decentralization from the Manhattan and Central Business Corp, and ferry uh, access, bike riding, walking to work. I think all of these things are gonna matter more in the coming years. And so we have an ability to go through a zoning where we can put millions of square feet online, uh, create a future Central Business District that's outside of Manhattan in a place where the talent is there, the transportation is there, the possibilities are there. So that's another place where if you, take, if you think about what it takes to get through a ULERT, it's timed quite nicely to allow it to respond to the needs of, of New Yorkers as we look at life post COVID. And then lastly, the office building on Barrack Street, which is a jewel of a building, it's 150,000 square foot uh, potential uh, office building. And to my mind, it's not exactly a, a spec giant, right? It's a, it's a building we could design as a model for what uh, office space ought to look like. And we're following the trends and we're talking to people, everybody from architects, engineers to uh, fellow developers, because in, in all of our experiences and all of our conversations, there are takeaways. But the last point I'll make is that having lived through 9-11, Sandy, uh, the Great Recession, you know, you don't want to make any sudden moves right now. So people after 9-11, we were building the New York Times building and we sat around saying, wow, we fought so hard for floors 28 through 52. And now nobody believes anybody would want to be in a high floor across from the Port Authority, which was obviously a high uh, target terrorist uh, location. And people thought we were doomed. And, uh, you know, you can't, I think, take the anxieties and the concerns that are being um, discussed at this very moment and start extrapolating and creating a new normal because we're in the eye of the hurricane right now. So yes, we have to pay attention. Yes, we have to be super sensitive to what people are feeling. But I think there's life, you know, pre-vaccine and life post-vaccine. And it's all about safety and security and people want to feel safe. And I, I, I would submit that people are in New York because they crave the human connection. They crave um, collaboration. And if we can make people feel safe, and we can give people maybe a new model of how we work. So if we have a lot of independent work, we can work from home, but it doesn't mean we're not gonna to wanna to be um, with others. And I, so I'm still betting on New York 
And, you know, I'm a developer, so I, I guess I'm optimistic by my nature. I wouldn't get out of bed every morning. But I think that the city has been through um, uh, challenges before, and it always comes back better than before. Well, it's great that you're thinking of those innovations. It sounds like you have a lot of good things in play right now. Um, speaking of innovation, uh, it's, it's, you've talked in the past about assembling an all-women-led development team uh, for SheBuild, I believe it's called. Uh, can you elaborate on this? I know we have a lot of women at Stern who are going into real estate. We host a women in real estate panel every year. Uh, so I'd love to hear more about this. It feels like a lifetime ago that we were talking about the she building. And I thought of it, um, I think it was a Remy event where I was asked, um, what am I thinking about these days? And I would say to you, it's, it's a small idea, but it's a big impactful outcome, which is any of us in the business know that a, a group of um, able-bodied women professionals could put a building together from beginning to end through the entire cycle of what it takes. And not that this is something that has to happen. It just would be for me, really fun to do because there are best in class women in every, absolutely every single category necessary to put a, a building together. And so I think it would be great fun. And I would say it doesn't matter what, um, what the question is, the answer is always the money. So I think I start with this idea that some of my uh, prospective investors are women. And I think that, that we have a lot of fun talking about this. And I think that if the capital, the equity, um, were uh, stood up by a woman investor, the rest would follow. And so I have this on my short list of things I'm going to get to in my lifetime. But until such time as that happens, I think my, um, my message to the women out there uh, is that where I am now, my perch allows me to, on my bully pulpit, to talk about um, how capable um, young professional women are in being developers and being in our industry. I came from a meritocracy. I was always you know, in, a, in an environment where I was the best man or woman for the job. And I, and I have to say that I benefited from that meritocracy. And that's all that we women want. Nobody wants a special handout or a favor. We just want a level playing field. And as I find myself in the role of a CEO inside public companies like Jeffries and Matt Cali, I think that I have um, a contribution that I can make um, every single day that I show up uh, until that sheet building idea gets legs. And that is to create opportunities and avenues for women in C-suites and in boardrooms, because that's where uh, it becomes uh, harder to imagine that there's going to be true equity in our business. But the more women that are in boardrooms, the more women that are in C-suites, uh, the more we ask the questions about diversity, the more we create opportunities for capable women who are eager to move through um, you know, the corporate ladder. So I'm, I'm, I think my piece in this whole story is to create opportunities for all the uh, women at, uh, at NYU Stern um, as they go on in their career and they become more senior, it gets harder, right? And so it's not just about the number of women in our business, it's about the number of women in leadership posts that we have to focus on. And so that I consider to be my duty, my responsibility, my chance to give back. Thank you for that. You, Marianne, you seem to be somewhat of a, of a pioneer by nature. And uh, I guess my question to you is, you know, you recently kind of branched out. You talked about buying your partners out and, and really kind of launching out into your own company. What would your advice be to other either aspiring real estate entrepreneurs that are maybe thinking or considering launching a business? What would your advice be to them? So I am by my very nature a bootstrapper. Um, I think that I, I'm not risk adverse, but I'm a bootstrapper. So when I left Forest City, I negotiated a contract with Forest City and then Brookfield to capitalize my company because I do, again, I'm going to focus on the money. I hate to say it, but even if we're on a quest to do magical things and change the world, it does take resources. So knowing that I had the team and knowing that I had the ambition, the quest also involves the capital. And so locking the capital down initially through a contract with uh, Forest City and Brookfield enabled me to pick the best partners that I needed at that time. And people told me, go out and raise your own money. You don't need to, to partner with anybody. And I think um, I would be careful not to, um, you know, the hubris of thinking that you can do things that maybe you've never spent a lot of time doing in your career. Uh, even the most ambitious amongst us, you need to look at where you have gaps in your, um, in your team or your abilities. And so partnering with David and Rob allowed me to uh, team up with operators uh, who knew how to access capital. Now I could have gone right to the capital, but I chose to go to the operators and then I created um, a ripcord, you know, an ability for me to say after two years, 
uh, if the partnership is working, great. And if the partnership needs tweaking, then we should be prepared to do that. And so two years in, I realized that um, we had the same playbook. They just knew how to hustle for the money. And for the two years that we hung out together, I was able to, to watch and to be exposed to those relationships. And we redefined our partnership. And now they'll invest friends and family in my next, um, my next uh, pipeline of projects. And I moved from two operating partners to a capital partner. And so that to me is just that sort of um, willingness to look deep and look hard at what you need and not, first of all, be afraid to say that you need certain things, right? That you can't do it all or have it all um, day one. And then to, to work hard to try to round out um, the, the model, the business model, so that success is, you know, is all but certain. And so that's how I've approached it. I mean, I would never have left Forest City um, hired people and worried about the money later. This is not, not how I am. I think the capital in our business is everything. And so identifying capital and recognizing if you're a strong operator, you, if you have experience, um, the capital will follow. There's a lot of money out there, but what we do in, in, in my field, it's the operators that are, that are um, harder to come by, the ones that are capable, responsible, deeply experienced, uh, full of integrity and know how to be good partners. So that's my story, but I would say that that story probably has translations in every aspect of the real estate business. And uh, it comes down to partnerships. And, uh, you know, it's great people that do great things and you can fix um, a bad deal, but you can't fix a bad partnership. So, you know, the company you keep, I think you have to be very, very mindful of the company you keep. And I would say that as I mentor young people, I tell them that if they can go into an organization that doesn't have maybe the same brand appeal as, you know, another option, but they have an incredible boss or leader that you would rally around and for, that is so much more interesting and so much more beneficial to a young person than going into a giant company that maybe on paper looks like it's the be all and end all of real estate, but you end up a cog in a wheel and you don't have access to smart people and you don't feel a sort of passion. So I come back to why, like, why do we do what we do? And you got to be able to answer that for yourself. And if it's all about the money and that's why you do it, then that's actually easy. But if it's also about feeling purpose and if it's also about making a difference and making money and getting up every day and feeling good about what you do, these considerations matter. And I just encourage people at, you know, at, the age that you guys are, which is you've got a couple of cycles in you. And back in the day, if you left a company after a few years and bopped to another company, you know, people would look at you and say like, well, we don't seem to be able to settle down. Um, now, if you stick around too long in an organization, people start asking, why haven't you explored other alternatives? So you're the great beneficiaries of the innovation economy where people expect you to be curious. People expect you to um, to, to, to be opportunistic about your own career. And so because of that, you have um, permission to explore, permission to take chances, permission to make mistakes and recover. So I would just encourage people to feel that sense of curiosity, that sense of audacity, and at the same time, be rational about what it takes to get the job done. Great advice. Great. Yeah, um, kind of dovetailing, dovetailing off that, um, we have a career mentorship program at Stern. Did you have a mentor that kind of stuck out and kind of helped you along the way at all? Uh, and as a mentor, you just saved some great advice. So I'll kind of leave it at that uh, and not ask you to give more advice to students. Uh, I think you did a great job on that. Um, so yeah, if you had a mentor along the way, uh, what I, advice I, did you receive from them? Indeed I did. And I think I had uh, probably informal mentors, meaning I don't think I ever went to someone and said, will you be my mentor? But you know, it's it, having Marianne Ty be a mentor is like hitting the career lottery. So I would say that um, I met Marianne long ago in my career. Uh, I cold called her to have lunch with Bruce and I when I was running the office portfolio at Forest City. And uh, Bruce just thought it was so ridiculous that I would call Marianne Ty and set lunch at the Four Seasons so that we could talk about doing business together. And she never forgot it. Like I was this young, I don't know, 20 something year old who again had the audacity to think, you know, Bruce, you and I should meet her. And Marianne has this policy of always returning people's phone calls, you know, one way or the other. So I got her on the phone. I invited her to lunch. We went to the Four Seasons. Bruce was so angry at me. And that led to her inviting us to bid on the New York Times building. And um, we ended up having a great friendship. But Marianne believed in me more than I believed in myself. And I would say she saw things in me that I wouldn't have been able to see because of her experience and her wisdom. 
And so we are great friends, but she is for me sort of the, um, the one who makes our business look uh, so intellectually uh, challenging and glamorous and um, civic. And she just has, uh, she has it all going on. So I, I consider myself lucky to have her as, as a friend, but she really um, is still a mentor to me and somebody that if I need a lifeline, definitely, you know, she's on speed dial for me. And the other is Bruce Ratner. And uh, with Bruce, I'd say that um, we had uh, many decades together and I am the beneficiary of the fact that Bruce Ratner's daughters had no interest in going into the business. And so I'm mindful of the fact that in the dynasty business of New York City real estate development, if Bruce's family were in the business, it might have ended up differently for me. But Bruce, as a result of being the father of two girls, was super supportive of women. He, he ran a meritocracy and he dared to think the things that people were afraid to think. And so I came through a culture as if you could dream it and believe it and defend it, we could talk about it. And so um, he taught me to be um, prepared and to be, uh, you know, really just ferocious in fighting for what we believe in. And um, that kind of passion is infectious. And I think we were probably like-minded and cut from the same cloth from the very beginning, but I was able to grow up um, in the likeness of Bruce Ratner. The hardest job I ever took was the job of replacing Bruce as the CEO of our city, just because the shoes were so enormous to step into. But even that was one of the most gratifying experiences one could ever ask for in a career. And so uh, between Bruce and Marianne, I am um, really lucky on the mentor front. And, and as a result, it's taught me that mentorships, informal or formal, are really important to young professionals. And for that reason, um, I try to do the same for others. And Marianne, what um, kind of along those same lines, along that same kind of line of thinking, what books would you recommend to real estate students? So, you know, look, The Power Broker is a must read just because it, it really teaches you, Robert Caro teaches you how, um, you know, someone like Robert Moses could have such an impact on our city and never have been elected. And so that's a book that stays with me and um, you learn all sorts of reasons why the city and the areas surrounding the city are the way they are. And again, if you're a placemaker like I am, it's um, mind-blowingly important to, to, to understand um, the power of a non-elected office. And so it's a really good book to read. And then, um, you know, on the other end, I would say here in New York, E.B. White is a book that, uh, particularly at a time like today, where we look at the gaudiest, most beautiful, most crowded, most private, most satisfying, most heartbreaking city in all of history. And we say to ourselves, it's New York. And I think it's, um, it's a way to feel hope because we have to stay addicted to hope right now. Um, we should not have lots of other addictions if we can help it, but I think hope <laughs> is very important right now. And so that book always makes me feel um, really good about New York. So I think that it's a quick, easy read. It's a real pick me up. It's a beautiful piece of literature. And, you know, I like to think that we, we are making the city like poetry one block at a time. And so I really favor that book. Great. Thank you. Um, so we have our students graduating this month in May. Uh, what advice would you have for those undergrad and MBA students who are graduating this May, starting to recruit for jobs or already in the middle of recruiting for jobs, uh, especially during this time of COVID-19? I see opportunity and I'll tell you why, because the industry is going to have a shakeup. We're going to go through some um, challenging times. Uh, the built environment is always going to have a place and I think it's going to be young people who embrace technology, are not afraid of change, and have the might and the, and the, the appetite to forge through it. I mean, that, it's an amazing moment in the sense that for all of you to live through something like this, not that we'd wish it on anyone, but as uh, Winston Churchill says, you know, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And so I would say that uh, many of you guys know if you sit around and you're new in the business and somebody says, you weren't there when the Great Recession hit, and you have to listen to all these old timers tell you and school you. <laughs> right, as to what you'll never know anything about. Now you have a pandemic under your belt. And so I would say that you have an opportunity to look at your business through a lens unlike anything you'll ever have imagined you could have experienced. And you will do your work differently as a result. So even those of us that take risks will look at downsides differently because of the pandemic. I mean, leases are being rewritten. Loans are being rewritten. The world is getting rewritten. And in that is a tremendous amount of opportunity because you guys have 
um, a birth before you have a runway of your careers. And I would say technology, which has been, you know, in real estate, we're dinosaurs. We are slow, slow to adapt and it's going to accelerate and it's going to change in a mighty kind of a way. And so if you're young, if you've got real estate in your veins, like I do, you understand the power of technology and you're willing to work hard. I think you've got incredible advantages. And I think a lot of people in the business that are mid-level, upper level management might just say, you know, I'm done. Like I'm going to move on. I'm going to retire. I'm going to step away. I think you'll have sort of a, a turnover in the industry because, you know, if people who are tired and are hanging, hanging on by a cat hair have the ability to say, I'm going to redefine my future. I'm going to take um, a time to myself. I'm going to, I'm going to move. I'm going to reexamine my life. It's going to create all sorts of opportunities throughout um, organizations that, that do the things that we do. So I'd look for those opportunities. I would stay optimistic. I would stay on the forefront of all the trends and I would embrace technology. I think those are gonna put you, those, those activities will put you in the, the greatest position to take advantage of, of um, life post COVID. And I wanna leave you know, on a point of optimism. I think human behavior is such that we revert back to the things we enjoy and that we like. So I do think that people will go and watch concerts and go back to, to arenas and congregate and have um, large scale get togethers, but it comes back to safety and security. And that's the, the, the challenge of the day. And so I think we have to look at the world like here and now and then life after. And in the life after category, I, I have a lot of optimism that um, we're gonna get to work. Well, thank you so much. I know we're at time. Uh, I really appreciate all of your thoughtful responses. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you again. Thanks for thinking of me, and uh, it was really been a pleasure. Be safe. Mm -hmm.